I want to thank Joe and Kathy and um, for being elders and Dave and Audrey Rollins for uh, being an elder and, and wife and um, Bryce and Julie, um, I almost said Bryce and Julie Backtold, you almost got family members. <laughs> Tubal, um, someone help me out and uh, Bill Mark Cordes who is still down south in Alabama and still serves as one of our, our non-local elders and uh, who am I forgetting Joe? I got it all. Okay. Uh, and then I look at uh, Ray Sanders, who's our, our director, our building director. And yeah, this is, uh, by the way, this is where I start getting in trouble because I start not having all the names. And so I'm in trouble zone. But I, I look at Jim, who uh, came over to our house yesterday, Jim Rennish, and said, I spent four hours on the soundboard. Jim, I don't even know what that means. All right. So basically that means Jim did something that will make him never, ever get noticed, ever. Right? Because a good sound man is the one you never hear. <laughs> Isn't that odd? Um, and then Elliot Sanders, who um, you know, remodeled the entire other room. And of course, my wife, Nancy, who is a phenomenal just co-leader in life in this church. And I don't know where to stop. So just thanks, you guys. And, and thank you to our nursery and love. Oh, I just, uh... Mike, thank you. I don't even know what you did, but thank you, all right? <laughs> you know, it's cool. Everybody. Um, Brian Schenicke uh, and the men went on a men's retreat. We're gonna hear a testimony from them. Um, Micah and some of the, the college crew um, are gonna be sharing. But when they got back, I just heard these reports of Brian Schenicke, who Brian and Sam have been at our church for, I don't know, 15 years. And um, been through the highs and the lows and the valleys and the, uh, the mountaintop experiences. And, and uh, they just said, yeah, man, he really shepherded at us. You know, Brian Schenicke really shepherded us. You know, we. So many in this room, you know, um, ministry is a team sport, praise God. I remember so many years that Nancy and I did this alone, and every year I'd knock on Pastor Josh's, uh, you know, door, virtual door, whatever it was, and Diana, and I'd say, hey, is this the year you're going to come be a, the worship pastor journey? And he goes, no, God's not called me yet. <laughs> Next year it comes, no, God's not called me yet. A decade, I felt like Laban trying to marry, you know, or, you know, Seven years, another seven years, right? And, uh, but then I think it was the 10th year. Hey, you want to come be a pastor at Journey? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, well, I'll call you next year. No, wait, this year, right? But, uh, man, it's, uh, it's a team sport. And so thank you, team, for being awesome. You know, I'm even looking back at Mildred, who's trying to hide back there. Mildred, um, way back in the day when they built the building, which was College Avenue, that we're, we're now meeting in his journey, um, you helped start that church. And uh, her and her wife, Jim, have been faithful um, servants of the Lord. I, I, I could go on and on about Mildred and all the things brought in. I, I'm not going to do it, Mildred, because I know. But, uh, you know, each one of you has that story. It's just crazy what God has done. I look at Terry Dye back there, who's not making eye contact with me. Terry, if I could tell all the exploits of your life. You know, we'd be here forever. Father, I just thank you for this good church and these good people. And I echo what Pastor Josh said. God, we're here for a reason. And, and as the world gets darker, I, I believe fully that our light is going to shine brighter. God, that we're going to be bold and courageous in this community and in this world. We're not trying to build a big church. God, you say you will build your church. But Lord, we want to become disciples. We want to become Jesus lovers. We want to bless you. We want to be in your presence. And we just love you. Were you going to say something, Nancy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, one last thing, and a huge thing, but um, the kids of all of our leaders. Man, um, they, if you could stare into their mind, Julie, I'm looking at you, who's leading our discipleship ministry, and her kids that clean our church. Every Sunday that our, our church is clean, Julie Perhe and her, and her kids clean our church. And then she leads our, our women's discipleship on every other Wednesday night. I mean, I, I just, don't, just don't know where to stop, really. Our college students, <laughs> Micah and Julia, and, and now some new leaders that are coming on, lead Magnify, which is, a, I, I went and hung out with them on Tuesday night on the college campus. They have this amazing student group that just, they started, just said, Pastor Jason, can we start a student group at campus? I, yes or no, they didn't care, we're going to do it anyway, we're just, you know, and started this incredible group called Magnify at Campus, and they're reaching our campus, and I believe that God's going to use that, because did you know that 
29 years ago, no, 31 years ago, God started a, a little group at ISU called Chi Alpha, which Nancy and I led for 12 years. And that little campus group it started with about seven or eight people, the same amount you had on Tuesday night, grew into a, a thriving campus ministry that saw thousands of people come to know the Lord, hundreds get baptized in the Holy Spirit, janitors got healed, and it became the genesis group of what now is Journey Church here today. So who knows what God's going to do with that? All right, we actually have a message this morning. Does anyone know how the Chiefs are doing playing in Germany right now? Don't tell me. Do not tell me. I'm recording it. No one tell me the Chiefs score, okay? Um, how about we talk about healing today? Doing a, a supernatural series um, like Pastor Josh. Thank you, Pastor Josh, for preaching last week. I've not heard his message yet, but I've had a, a ton of people say that God really, really moved through that, and I can't wait to, to listen and be ministered to by it. I've seen a lot of healings um, over the period of uh, about 37 years as a believer. Um, one of the first stories I heard about healing was, it was really interesting, you might know this guy, a guy named Dean Neferatus, when I was a campus pastor. He prayed over um, somebody. I remember, remember hearing this testimony, I'm like, that's not possible, what he just said there. Dean Neferatus, Neferatus was a radical Greek believer, and he uh, walked up to some kid when he was a college pastor, I can't remember the campus, uh, who had a huge wart on their nose. That's it. If you have a wart on your nose, that, that's all right. I got a big mole on my arm, all right? Um, but he had a huge wart on his nose, and it bothered him, and um, he just walked up to him and touched the, the, the guy's wart. This sounds a little weird. By the way, I don't recommend this. I'm just saying this is what happened. Um, he just touched his wart and said, get off of him in Jesus' name. And he said, the wart literally just popped off and fell on the ground. And he said he just looked at his finger for like two hours after that. He couldn't believe it. For real. True story. True story. Um, I remember the, uh, the first healing that, that I, I physically saw um, was a little boy in, uh, some of you know this story. By the way, Tom Marco elder for like seven years. Melissa, thank you. Thank you. That's why he's got all that gray hair in his beard now. Um, we were in Mexico on a missions trip and we prayed for a little boy who didn't have his voice. Um, um, someone was praying in their prayer language. We'll talk about that. We're going to have some conversation about prayer language and what all that is. It's really awesome. But they were praying over them in a unknown prayer language, a teenager praying over a mom who was praying over her son who looked a little freaked out. And um, the lady turned around, spun around and said to our teenager who was praying in a prayer language over this lady who only spoke Spanish, she started going crazy and said, um, and, you know, just something in Spanish really loudly. And she said, um, what are you saying? Got our translator, our translator got over and said, you just told her your son can't speak and God's gonna give him a voice today. And so she started freaking out. And of course, when you got a bunch of teenage kids on a mission trip in Mexico, they all start freaking out. So everybody starts praying over this little boy. I feel kind of bad because I'm shooting the whole thing on video. I'm like, this poor little boy, right? He's freaking out. And so I thought, what do you do? So I, gave, I came around. We had these little gifts. I had a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle doll. I got this all on video, by the way. And I, I knelt down next to him, and I, I gave him this little doll. I'm still rolling the camera. And he looks at me. He holds the doll, kind of smiles, and goes, gracias. And then he goes, so he goes, gracias. Never made a sound in his life. I was there, I have it on tape. Crazy, crazy. Um, I remember one time when I heard that wart story, I had a wart on my finger. I'm like, I'm gonna pray for this wart to go away. Guess what? It didn't go away. But I prayed again. I'm like, God, you can take care of me. It was huge, I couldn't bend my finger. I could not bend my finger, it was so big. And it, it it was just nasty, right? And I remember just in my youthfulness as a new believer, I just said, God, I'm gonna try that again. God, would you take my ward away? It was massive. I couldn't afford to have it removed. And I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and it was gone, gone, baby smooth skin in its place. Crazy. I didn't even, I was, I was so young as a believer, I didn't even know that it was crazy. I'm like, oh cool, what else can I pray for, right? <laughs> it's funny, it is. How many of you believe that God has the, the, the ability to touch a body and heal it? Amen? It's supernatural. It's super, I feel like that guy on TV. It's supernatural. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about, some don't. 
Um, I believe it as well. And if you look at scripture, the Old Testament, there is healing after healing after healing. 30 different times Jesus heals people who are sick in body. And it's implied through scripture that there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times that people were, were healed. Jesus opened blind eyes. I've seen a blind man receive his healing right in front of me. Verifiably blind, eyes covered in, in cataracts. Again, this was in Mexico. Could you just white eyes, pray for him, and eyes clear as a bell, and could see. Talk about a freak out moment. You know, sometimes people say, why does that happen overseas? Why does that happen south of the border? How come? I think sometimes people just have a more of a desperation because there's no other option. That guy traveled for days to be at that revival and that, that meeting that we had, just a bunch of teenagers. Um, he helped people that couldn't walk, walk. He raised the dead. If you, if you look at the book of Acts, um, I wanna share a story with you. There was a time when the apostle Paul was preaching and uh, he was preaching and it went on really, really long. Now you guys have been at Journey for a while so you know you can relate, <laughs> all right? <clears throat> Some of you are like, okay, he usually is on point number one, it's one told, yeah. So he's preaching this really long sermon and it says that this guy named Eutychus, Eutychus was a, a kid, <clears throat> and he was sitting in a window, <clears throat> excuse me, a little moment to myself, this is where everyone can cough awkwardly because when one person coughs everyone just do it get it out <laughs> yeah now everyone's going to be like freaking out about cough no you can cough cough freely my friends all right <laughs> so Eutychus was a kid he was he fell asleep in the middle of a sermon and he falls out of a window and he dies right now, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever died in a journey service because of my preaching. Let's keep that record, okay? Let's keep that going. And then Paul goes down there, lays hands on him, and raises him from the dead. Um, uh, amazing. Um, one of the most controversial of all miracles in the New Testament was when Jesus um, healed Peter's mother-in-law. He healed his mother-in-law. Um, some people say that um, uh, that's what most scholars agree, uh, agree that that is why Peter denied Jesus three times. I, I was setting up for a bad joke. You're supposed to laugh there. But um, okay, never mind. You, you know, I had a pastor once tell me never make mother-in-law jokes. All right, I did. I violated it. I'm done. All jokes over. Dangerous joke. Um, but Jesus heals. He heals in Scripture. He has the power to heal. Uh, John 4:12 says, "Verily, now listen. I want you to hear this, church. This is so important." And by the way, at the end of our service this morning, we're gonna pray over each other for healing. We're gonna ask, if you've come today, you're sick in body, you're sick in, uh, you're, you're heart sick, you're emotionally sick, you're, you're um, spiritually sick, and you're physically sick, we're gonna pray over you. But I, I want you to really absorb what I'm about to tell you, what Jesus is about to tell you. John 14, 12, very truly I tell you, Whenever Jesus says verily, verily, or very truly, what he's saying is, listen to me, I really want you to hear this. That's what he's saying. Very truly, or in the New King James, in the King James, very, verily, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Let that soak in. Grab a hold of that. <clears throat> I believe the same power that healed the sick when Jesus walked the earth is the same power that he will pour out and has poured out in you today. Amen. I believe it. I fully believe it. And that, <clears throat> that's why today we are going to pray for healing in people. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at the other side of this. How many of you are aware of someone who needed healing and never got healed? Yeah, for real. It's happened among us, hasn't it? In the last few days. In the last few days, it's happened. <clears throat> um, how do we reconcile the fact that God would choose to heal some and would not heal others? That is a very fair question to ask. And I think some of us are, are afraid to ask that. Thank you, Cole. <clears throat> or we're afraid to 
pray for healing because we, we don't want him not to heal, right? How do we reconcile? What do we do? How do we go before a God? How do we pray if we believe that he can and he has healed others, but he doesn't always do what we know he could do or maybe what we even think he should do in our very own life or the life of people that we love? How do we reconcile that fact? I want to talk about that today. I want to jump into that fully. And so in order to do that, I'm going to give you a key thought this morning, okay? Here's the key thought. <clears throat> I want us to embrace this truth. I want us to embrace that our God heals, but he doesn't heal everyone all the time. Everyone say, our God heals, our God heals. but he doesn't heal everyone all the time. Say it. But he doesn't heal everyone all the time. It's true. So... <clears throat> The reality is, this isn't just in our lives, okay? There's people in scripture that walk through the same thing. I'm gonna give you three examples that are incredibly true of people in scripture. So the first one is from 2 Timothy 4.20. There's a guy named Trophimus. Um, he was one of Apostle Paul's friends. He accompanied the Apostle Paul on his third missionary journey. They traveled together, they knew each other well. Trophimus got sick and that verse in 2 Timothy 4.20 says, <clears throat> Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. He left him sick. He didn't get healed. God could have done it, but he didn't do it. He just left him there and continued to go and do what they needed to do. God could have, God didn't. All right, so second example of someone in Scripture who, who, who has this thing. Um, Timothy. Timothy had stomach issues. He had, he had a, a gut issue. We don't know exactly what it was. Timothy was literally a protege of, of Paul. He was Paul's spiritual son. And it says in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul gives him advice. He says, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. So Timothy, the spiritual son of Paul, wasn't healed. God could have done it, but God didn't do it. Um, third one, um, there's... The Apostle Paul himself, it said he had something called a thorn in his side. You know, it's interesting. Here's a little side note on that. Um, just the other day, I got a thorn in my finger. You know what I noticed about it? First of all, it was painful. Yeah, I don't recommend it, all right? <laughs> got a thorn in my finger. Actually, it was, at, um, it was at our fall festival, which, by the way, was awesome. A um, little side note on our fall festival, I had a, there was a couple that was there, and I recognized them. And they had a bunch of people that they brought with them. And they don't go to Journey. They just, they're from the community. And I said, hi, I've seen you for, before. And the wife looked at me and she goes, we, you have. She goes, we heard about this four years ago and we come every year. It's our family's favorite event of the fall. And she brought a whole bunch of people with them. So thank you for everyone just made that an outreach. We're just going to keep growing that and doing that every year. But Paul had a thorn in his side and I got a thorn in my finger at the fall festival. And I noticed about that thorn that, that sometimes I wouldn't, think it was there, but when I rub up against it, it was. Maybe you've got a thorn in your side. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an issue. Maybe it's physical. And sometimes you just kind of live with it. And sometimes something rubs against it and it hurts. You almost forget about it. Paul had that. Scholars have guessed that it was bad eyesight, temptation, all sorts of things, relationships. We don't know for sure, but we know that he pleaded three times. The Bible says three times Paul said, God, would you take this from me? And if you look at that word pleaded, the original word for, or language for that word means that he had an ongoing, persistent travailing for a season with God to try and get that thing out of his life. He really, really, really prayed. And God didn't heal. Why? Why? It's hard because if we get honest, we've seen, you know, it's like, God, why won't you do this for me? I've seen bigger things. I've seen um, you do this in other, I've seen you do this in, in people's lives, God, who are jerks. Did I just say that from the platform? Are there actually jerks in this world? Yes, there are, it's biblical. I just can't show it to you in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are people that, that you don't like that got the healing that you, that you wanted and God says, I could do this, but I'm not going to. And that's a hard answer from the Lord. But what he says is I'm going to show you is that my grace in this situation that you're going through is gonna be sufficient for you. And that I can do all things 
and, and that the things that are meant to harm you, I'm going to use for your good. So our God, let me just summarize this and say our God can, he often does, but when he doesn't, it's hard to deal with it. It's hard to deal with it. Here's what's even harder. Sometimes Christians, I've given you this advice before, when something really, really bad happens, let me tell you what you can say when you're in that person's presence that something really bad happened to. Nothing. Just be in their presence. Just be around them. Someone going through a divorce, someone, child dies, spouse dies. Don't feel like you have to come up with something to say. I think there's a lot of well-meaning Christians, and I've been this before, where we make comments like, well, you know, a daughter dies. You say, well, Jesus just wanted another angel in heaven. Don't say that. Okay, because why did he choose mine? That means God's a selfish God, right? So let's just, well, meaning, so forgive those who say things and just say they don't know what they're saying. It's like Jesus on the cross. I'm not making a joke here, but when he looked down and he said, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <clears throat> just forgive. Have that same forgiveness of the Lord. Don't, don't get offended. Just, um, I think sometimes Christians can um, heap guilt and con condemnation on someone that's going through a hard time. If you just would have prayed harder, if you just would have believed more, if you just had more faith. Um, <laughs> oh boy. I remember years ago, one of my children, one of Nancy and I's children was in a competition. I'm not gonna say any, this is years and years and years ago. And um, my child and their partner in this competition lost the competition. And the parent of the other child who our, our, our child was uh, connected with, um, came up to Nancy and I and said um, that they, they lost. And we said, yes, yeah, that happens in competitions. <laughs> and she said to us, she goes, what sin is he in? And then went up to our son and said, um, suggested some sins, some secret sins he might be in that caused them to lose. Yeah, I know, you guys are like, I could throw olives into your mouths right now. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, what do you say to that, right? He did. He's a sinner. He did. Um, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of winning this competition. Um, I think that's what the Bible says. What do we do with a God that we know can heal, but sometimes doesn't? What do we do? We're going to continue to build on our foundation. Our God heals, but he doesn't always heal everyone all the time. All right, that's our foundation. But let me give you three quick reasons why Jesus doesn't always do healing. Why he doesn't. Why he often did it, but sometimes he doesn't. Why he doesn't do it sometimes. And the first reason is this, real simple this morning. Jesus refused to perform miracles to prove himself. Jesus refused to perform miracles. Miracles to prove himself. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever done this when you're a kid or when you're a pre-believer. You say, God, if you'll just do this thing for me, I will serve you forever, right? I confessed several weeks ago that Karen Cradler, I tried to find her on Facebook so I could, you know, see if she's still around. But Karen Cradler, I, I, as, as a second grader, you know, I, I, pulling her hair was not getting the attention or the love from her that I wanted, right? So I said, God, if you, just, if you just help me marry Karen Cradler, I will follow you all the days of my life. And she didn't, and that's why I didn't get saved until I was 17, right? We, we pray that. We say, God, if you'll just do this. Mark, um, the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8, verse 11 through 12, this is really interesting. The Pharisees began to question Jesus, um, and they had a, an unusual heart motive, actually a very normal heart motive. They were asking for a sign some uh, a sign from heaven. They wanted him to prove that he was the son of God. They wanted him to prove it with a miracle. The thing is, they already knew there were verified miracles out there. They just wanted to see the horse and pony show. And they said, hey, will you do a miracle? And this is really interesting. Mark 8, 11 through 12. The Pharisees came. We know their heart motive. Began to question Jesus to test him. They asked for a sign from heaven. Look at the interesting words in the next verse. Look at this. He sighed deeply. Jesus sighed deeply. I believe he paused for a moment. And he said, why does this generation ask for a sign to himself? And then he looks at the Pharisees and he says, truly, I tell you, no sign will be given. 
So I'm not going to dance for you. Not going to. I'm not going to dance for you. I'm, I'm not going to do a miracle to prove myself. I, I do miracles. Jesus, said, I do miracles that are in line with the will of the Father. I'm not. I'm not just going to do it just because he knew this. They, they wouldn't believe him anyway. They, they wouldn't believe him anyway. A lot of people say, God, I'll give my life to you if you do this for me. Don't wait on that. Please don't wait on that. Just give your life to him, church. Give your life to him. Um, you who are struggling with that. Um, um, here's the second thing. Jesus, so um, first he didn't want to prove himself. That's why sometimes he didn't do miracles. Second thing is this. Jesus never performed a miracle that interfered with God's ultimate plan for someone's life. He never, he never did. Um, here's another story. It's one that we're very familiar with um, of God choosing to do, uh, Jesus choosing to do a, a miracle to release the supernatural through a healing and then to not release the supernatural, all in the same story. So it's the story of Judas when he betrays Jesus. He kisses him on the cheek to show the guards. You remember this is in the Garden of Gethsemane right, right outside of it, um, the night that he was betrayed. So Judas kisses him on the cheek. Um, the guards come. They know that was the sign of this is the this is Jesus is the one who they're going to arrest and take to the cross, and you know they come to seize Jesus. Peter gets really mad, draws his sword, and slices off the guy's ear. Either that was like incredible sword work, or like a complete mess. Right? I've often thought about that. I don't know if he's like check this out. I'm just going to shave a little bit off of his ear, swing, or if he's just got the worst name ever. Ah, right? You can ask him in heaven. Either way. Either way, Jesus said, no, 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 no. This is not what we're going to do tonight. This is not what we're going to do tonight. And so he says, where's the ear? Peter, pick up the ear. They pick up the ear, give it to Jesus, and Jesus puts his hand on the man's head, and he's healed. Instantly healed. Pandemonium. Jesus steps in and performs a healing. And it's a teaching moment. He said, Peter, I'm not going to let this happen. This is not where we're going tonight because it's, it's, it's a wonderful verse out of Matthew 26, 53. He said, I'm going to heal Malchus. The guy's name was Malchus. I'm going to heal this Roman soldier, this Roman centurion, but I'm not going to do something that could protect me in the same moment. So it's in the verse, Matthew 26, 53. It says, don't you realize, Peter, in that moment, that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly. I could do that supernatural move right now in an instant, but verse 54, but he said, but if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Because there were dozens and dozens of scriptures that pointed to Jesus being the Messiah. And if this didn't happen, then one of those prophecies would be wrong. So Jesus said, I have to do this. So in one moment, he does a miracle of healing. And in the other moment, he doesn't do a supernatural miracle because it would interfere with God's plan. Do you see that? All in one moment. All in one, one, one time. So here's a question. When, de, uh, when did Jesus not do a miracle? He, he did not do it to prove himself. He didn't do it when the miracle would have a temporary earthly benefit, but not a long-term uh, benefit that God had ordained when it interferes with God's plan. He wouldn't do it. So number three. Jesus, and this is the one that, that we could struggle with the most, so I want to take a little time with it, okay? Jesus didn't do miracles when there was no faith. Jesus didn't do miracles when there was no faith. faith. And this is where we can easily go into a condemnation cycle. Because we can say, oh, I didn't have faith to see this, and that's why they died, or I didn't have faith to, and that's why they, or I didn't pray enough. And that, that's a lie from the enemy. Sometimes, you know, Nancy and I, when... When Luke, we, we, I'm not going to share all my stories, but just with Luke, you know, when he was, Nancy was pregnant with him, he almost miscarried. He didn't. God did a miracle inside of him. And then he was born missing his left hand. And, um, and I'm like, God, I, why didn't I just pray for a complete healing? And then I went on a guilt trip and then God used Luke and his missed hand. And we tried to get Luke a bionic hand and he goes, I don't need it. I don't need the extra fingers. They just get in the way. It's really kind of a funny story. Um, it wasn't funny in the beginning though. And then we prayed for Luke's arm. I'd always say, God, the, 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 the doctor said, because he can't use his left hand because it's missing, his right arm's going to grow a lot longer than his left arm, and he's going to look like this. And so for years I prayed, 
God, would you let Luke's left arm grow as long and as strong as his right arm? And guess what? It did. So when we went into the world's renowned surgeon at the Indianapolis Hand to, Sh uh, hand to Shoulder Center um, and talked with uh, Dr. William Kleiman, who's the top pediatric hand surgeon in the world, he looked at Luke's arm and he goes, I don't know how that happened. That's not possible. And you know what I thought? Why didn't I just pray for a new hand? <laughs> Duh! Well, because I know God can grow an arm long, but he certainly can't put a hand on. I've never seen the whole hand thing happen. Sorry, Luke, I failed you as a father. But God's used it. God's used it. He's used it. But he doesn't do miracles where there was, was no faith. But we can feel that way. I didn't do this, so God couldn't do that. But that's not how it works either. It's not just you go, Rah! you know, does he have a hand yet? Rah! What are you doing? I'm praying hard. No, you look like you need Pepto-Bismol, right? <laughs> when he went home to his hometown, people were not impressed with Jesus. They were not impressed. Matthew 13, 58 says, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. This is the carpenter's kid. I took splinters out of his hand. I took, I took a thorn out of his hand that he got at Fall Festival, right? He couldn't even remove a thorn. How is he going to do this? We have to understand that our faith moves the heart of God. Everybody listen to this. It's so important. Our faith moves the heart of God. And it doesn't take much to move his heart. Our faith matters to God. And when you pray in faith, it, it touches God's heart. Mark 5.34, I want to give you just a couple examples of this. Mark 5.34, there was a woman who couldn't stop bleeding. For 12 years, she bled. Uh, you know the story is the woman with the issue of blood. She's embarrassed. She's in pain. She's ceremonially unclean. It's very hard. And she said, if I could just touch the edge of his garment, then, then I, I would be healed. And she does that, and she feels the power. He feels the power leave him when she touches the hem of her, his garden. And he said, who touched me? And, you know, the... The disciples say, there's a huge crowd around you. How are we supposed to know? And he goes, no, power went out for me. I know someone touched me. And then Jesus saw her. She said, I did it. And he said, daughter, um, look, look at this verse. Your, what does it say, church? Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Here's another one. Luke 17, 19, a man with leprosy falls at the feet of Jesus, worships him. You know, he's cast out by society. Jesus looks at this man, and um, he heals him, and he says, rise and go your what? Faith. Say it again. Faith has made you well. Your, your faith, man who once had leprosy, made you well. Mark 10, 52, a blind man screams out. He, he says, I can hear you. You know, I, I can't see you, but I hear you. I know you're there. Have mercy on me. And Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. It's amazing. Our faith moves the heart of God. Let me tell you this. Your faith amazes God. Your faith amazes God. It's interesting because if you look at scripture, there, there are only two things. I've mentioned these in the past in other messages, but there are two things. Isn't that interesting? I said there are two things. <laughs> Listen, there are four things I want to share with you. Number one, and then B. Now I'm all messed up. There are two things, two different times, two different extremes that Jesus is recorded that he was amazed. The first one was a Roman centurion. The Roman centurion has a servant that's sick. And Jesus goes to him, or he goes to him and says, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. All you have to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. I, I just believe, Jesus, if you say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus looks at the man and he looks around and, he, and this is the only time he ever says this in scripture. It says that Jesus was amazed. Jesus was amazed. And he says, I've never seen faith like this before in all of Israel. He said, this Gentile, this person that doesn't even know what the son of man really, really means has more faith than all the people of all the generations that have come before. He was amazed by his faith. The, the other thing was this, so that, that's, he was amazed by that amount of faith. 
when he was the hometown prophet, we just shared that, it said um, when he went home as a prophet without honor into his hometown, he said, I'm amazed that you don't believe that I can do what I say I can do. And so he performed only a few miracles there. He was amazed by their lack of faith, by their lack of faith. And so I'm going to ask you a question, church. When it comes to your faith, which, which way would Jesus be amazed? Which, which way? And that, that, this is not a guilt trip. It's, it's a baselining. It's a baselining. Just to, so ask yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, I, I, I believe that Jesus can't heal, or I fully, 100%, absolutely believe he can heal. And I don't mean just others. I mean you and people that matter to you. Where on that scale are you? Circle your number in your mind. Be honest. You're three, you're 10, you're one, you're four. Jesus was amazed by faith. You know another way you can tell um, how, how your faith is? Look at your prayer life. What are you praying and believing God to do? Are you, you know, God bless this meal? That's good, bless your meal. But are, are you believing that God can do great things? Or what, 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 what do you believe? Now, this is hard, guys, because some of you, many of you, maybe even most of you, have believed for God to do great things, and he's not done them. And that gets us back to where this message started. What do we do with that kind of God? And how do we reconcile that? We prayed. Nancy and I prayed and prayed for our, our little girl, Shiloh, to be born, and she was miscarried. We prayed. We believed. She you know, others in this room, you've gone through that exact same thing. We believe that God would change our child, and they never changed. We believe that our lost son or our lost daughter, that prodigal, would come home, and they never did. We believe that grandma would be healed. We, we believe that, you know, it's interesting, Kathy, your mom, when we were in the nursing home, it was your mom, right? Okay. Uh, we were with Joe, uh, Kathy's mom. I just felt on my heart to just drive over and see Kathy's mom. I don't, I don't know if you're, I can't remember if you were there or not, Kathy. So I just wanted to go visit her. Um, and so I went to her, and it was, it, she was one day, two days, three days, just a week, somewhere in there, she passed away. And I remember walking into that room, and we knew she would pass away. We, were, we knew Grandma was getting close. I remember going in there and as a pastor, just you never know what you'll experience when you go into a room at that time. Well, I didn't expect joy. We just chatted for about 45 minutes or so, an hour. And I said, so, I always try to get real. I, I just said, so what are we praying for? What are we believing for? You know what her mom, Kathy Backtold's mom and grandma said in that hospital room? She said, I want to live as long as I can to reach a few more people in this nursing home. She goes, but when I reach the last one that I can reach, I'm ready to go home. I'm like, that's faith. And she went home. She finished her job. The good news is that faith moves God moves God. It's encouraging. Nina, you can come on up. Um, Jesus said, I know there's mountains in your life. I know there's mountains of fear. I know there's a mountain of, of medical things you're going through. I, I know there's torment in your spirit. I, I, I know that. I know that you're going through that. But he says that I know that you believed for something to be healed or I believe that God would intervene in the situation and you didn't see it happen and but God is saying this. He goes, I, I know you've got those mountains, but I want you to know that you don't need big faith. He goes, because I'm amazed by faith the size of a mustard seed. Just a tiny little bit. Just a little bit. Mark 9, 24 is, I've shared, I love this verse. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, Mark 9, 24. A dad whose son is demon-possessed, and he's just getting tortured by this demon. He's unwell. This boy's so unwell. It said the father was anguished. Parent, can, can, anyone, don't have to raise your hand, but can you relate? You anguish for your children when they're going through a hard time. You anguish for them. And, um, and <laughs> Jesus said, I can do anything. Do you believe that? And the, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. 
And then he realized, I'm lying. And he says, help me overcome my unbelief. Did you know that's just enough? Look at that. There's your example. Help me. Help me. I do believe, but God, do I believe enough? That's what he's really saying. I, I do believe, but maybe it's not enough. Help me. Help me overcome my unbelief because I'm still human. I, I'm, I'm still... I've seen you do it in other people, God. I prayed for it before and it didn't happen. Help me with my unbelief. I've, I, I've struggled because I, I, I'm hurt because I've, I thought you would intervene and you interviewed for, intervened for that person, but not me. Help me with my, my unbelief because I do believe you can. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief because if I get my hopes up and you don't, it's going to be really, really hard. So can you help me with my unbelief? And then guess what? He still doesn't answer it. And you're like, oh, what do I do with that situation? And Jesus looks on with loving understanding of this imperfect faith where we say, God, I'm doing the best I can. Would you just help me? Let me give you this last thought this morning. So I'm a, I'm a pastor, right? I've been about 32 years. Um, you guys are believers, many of you, for a long, long time. And people will come up to me and say, Jason, if you pray for someone and they don't get healed, does that rattle you? Does that mess you up? Does it make you not believe for the next time you pray for healing for someone? And, and I'm, it does not do that anymore. Because what I've learned is that we serve a God whose ways are higher than our ways, whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts.
So I'm going to ask you today, have you given your life to Jesus? Have you given your life to the King of Heals? Don't let a moment pass. Now I'm going to ask another thing. I'm going to ask anyone in this room, actually with all your eyes wide open, everybody's eye, heads up, eyes wide open, is there anyone where you stand this morning? With everybody looking around, you just raise your hand and say, I need to receive Jesus. Would you pray for me? This isn't usually how we do it in church. Is there anyone you'd say, would you pray a prayer for me to receive Jesus? I'm not going to make you come up here. I'm just going to pray with you where you stand, but it's so significant. I see your hand. Maybe some of you want to recommit your life. Anybody else? I see your hand. That's awesome. Who else? I see your hand. I see your hand. Who else? I want to give my life to Jesus. Let's do this thing, huh? Who else? I see your hand. Who else? I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to commit my life to Jesus today. All right. If you raised your hand, uh, someone around you, I want, I want somebody, I would just put your hand, whoever raised their hand around you, if you could just put a hand on her or him. Ladies, you're right there. I want you to pray. Don't worry, I'm not going to have you come out. Pray this prayer with me and believe in faith that Jesus is going to save you today. Pray this prayer. Just mean it from your heart to say, Dear Jesus, I come to you right now as a human. I'm so imperfect. I know I've sinned and I know I've fallen short. But God, today, I receive your son Jesus as the payment for my sin. Receive his forgiveness. Forgive me, God, for all I've done. Set me free. Come live inside me. Make me brand new. Because on this day, November 5th, 2023, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Would you give a clap off for your this morning? <laughs> Last thing. We're going to pray over one another and then we're done. All right, we're going to pray over one another. Is there anyone? Here's where we apply the word. All right, I'm not going to have you come forward because the Bible said, you guys remember that very first verse I shared with you? Very first verse. I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Uh, the, the verse that says, John 14, 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever, everyone say, I'm whoever, believes in me will do the works. Say, do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Is there anyone in this room? Please don't miss this opportunity. TJ prayed for me this morning about something. Would you, if you need healing in your body, your soul, your mind, your spirit, you need the touch of God, boldly raise your hand right now. I need healing in my life. Raise it really high, really high. Raise it so high that you need healing in your shoulder. Keep your hand up. Everybody look around. Or there's someone that you know. Let me add that. There's someone that you know that needs healing that you want to stand in for. Raise your hand. Everyone look around. Keep your hand up. I want everybody with their hand up to have someone come to them right now and just say, Jesus, I speak healing into this situation. Believe in faith. Do it right now, church. Go for it. Right now. Do it. Everybody has someone. Eddie, there's some ladies right there. Hey, Luke and Sophie. Oh, did you guys sit there? People that already got it. Okay. When you're done praying, you can be dismissed. God is good.